My name is Jonathan Taylor. I'm the Technical Marketing Manager for Civil Survey Solutions. And it's my pleasure today to introduce you to the technical webcast for road safety tools in civil site design. This is just a quick promo because we're going to be presenting civil site design as a, uh, as basically as what you can see here, something called Civil Site Design Plus. So you'll be aware, for many of you, that we traditionally operate on AutoCAD, BricsCAD, and Civil 3D. Well, we actually have another offering, which has been around for a, a fair while now, which is called Civil Site Design Plus. So this is a single installation of Civil Site Design inbuilt on its own AutoCAD platform. Because what you're going to be seeing is essentially the AutoCAD version of Civil Site Design, but as one complete package that we can uh, we can provide to you, uh, which is separate to um, things like subscription to Autodesk, etc. So uh, certainly if you uh, get a chance, have a look at our Civil Site Design website, and uh, there's a video on there, and you can also go and download it, get a free trial for 30 days, fully functioning. And get a sense of what it's uh, what it's like but uh, and if you're interested in going forward obviously please contact us worthwhile having a look at uh, the website so on that terry i will uh, i'll hand over to you so terry is our wa representative part of the technical services team and uh, he's based in perth got extensive knowledge certainly in civil 3d hence why he had civil 3d guru ne next to his name on that first slide but today terry you are our civil site design guru <laughs> yes <laughs> so um on that, I will, uh, I'll hand over to you. Well, thanks for that, Jonathan. Uh, I'll just think over to my next slide. Uh, today's session, we're going to be looking at some of the road safety uh, tools available in civil site design. There's a variety of tools available depending on uh, the type of project uh, that you're working on. So a local area um, road uh, uh, won't require necessarily super elevation and uh, speed checks, whereas a highway uh, would be more inclined to require those tools. So uh, there's not really a workflow per se, it's more of a, um, an area where the different tools are available. Uh, as you can see, there's, a, there's an array of tools. Um, I don't want to spend too long on the slideshow because I've got a lot to get through today, so we'll move on from that. And I'll jump straight into the project. Now this is, as J2 was saying, is the civil site design uh, plus platform, and you can see all the uh, all the usual civil site design controls are here. Uh, this will be more familiar to the uh, AutoCAD and BricsCAD users, as it has the um, alignments tab, which I'll be starting with. The civil 3D users won't have the alignments tab. We use the uh, civil 3D alignment tools on that platform. So the very first topic I want to cover will be applying a speed table to your alignment. So if you were to make an alignment, uh, you would go to the Create Alignment button, obviously. Uh, I'm editing alignments to look at the form for you guys. Uh, I don't want to spend too long in this session um, building things. So a lot of this stuff I have already preset and I'm just going to explain it rather than make it on the fly. Okay, so we've made a road called Main Road. Uh, we're assigning our speed table here with this button. And in this form, uh, you can choose your super elevation table. Uh, there's a few options in here. This has been rationalized uh, from earlier editions. Uh, predominantly, we were interested in either a rural or an urban environment for an Australia or for an Osroads compliant design. Uh, there's a, a few subtle differences. Those of you who have uh, nothing better to do and have looked through the, um, the Osroads guides will be I guess more familiar with the different tables that are applied. They're quite uh, complicated, use different standards for different speeds in different environments. Um, so we've done all that work for you and basically uh, rationalised that down to one of the two options. Um, of note though, in the Osroads guide, it does specify a few uh, criteria for which table to apply in which environment and there's limitations on the outcome. So for example, we're going to be using the urban uh, super elevation table uh, and we just uh, input our data here and you can see that there's only three, four, five percent available to apply as a maximum super elevation. If I was applying the rural table, then we have the uh, full spectrum of super elevations available. Um, the reason for that is because Osroads doesn't want people or designers applying a very aggressive super elevation in an urban environment so they can achieve the tight bends because uh, it basically um, creates an environment where a, a design can comply with the standard but is still 
encourages, I guess, or allows the behavior where there's a lot of really tight bends with really aggressive 10% super, uh, and that's um, dissuaded by uh, osteoids. And so that's why there's a different standard for urban, and that's why it only allows a maximum of 5%, so you can't achieve uh, too tight a bends. Now, just a little bit of context with uh, the super elevation tables. There's pretty much three elements. We're gonna show you some uh, super elevation later on, but there's basically three, um, three players in super elevation, there's the crossfall, there's the radius, and then there's the speed. And there's uh, each one affects the other. And so there's uh, a reason why you would choose a speed relevant to your design, the super elevation you expect to apply, and the radii that are available um, based on those criteria. Okay, so as we do our design in here, uh, this is a modeless form so I can pan and zoom around the drawing whilst the form is open. I've applied my super elevation table. And so here I can edit an IP for this bend. And you can see here how it's notifying me of the minimum uh, radius. And currently this radius has a 250 meter radius. So if I change that to, for example, 220, like that, it will let me apply the radius as the designer I'm in charge, but it does give me this uh, symbolic warning. And if I edit that IP, or if my design already has uh, radii that are too tight, you'll see here that it uh, changes the color, I get a prompt to tell me that it's, uh, that the minimum radius has uh, been violated and you cannot, uh, you can still design it as such. Um, options would be possibly to change the speed limit, which is, uh, we all know motorists are reluctant to do, or you can uh, change the uh, speed limits or the, um, if you can't adjust the radius due to site constraints, then you can increase the super, uh, assuming you haven't already used your maximum of 5%. So we'll change that back to 240 or 250. Okay. So yeah, those are the, uh, those are the influencing factors uh, for a super elevation setup, bunch of major alignment. There's also some prompts in the vertical grading editor for vertical curves. So in this form, anyone who's used civil site design will be very familiar with the vertical grading editor. And there's stuff in here which um, a lot of people might not be aware of. Uh, so for example, in this vertical curve here, you'll see that this curve, the top here is a different color to these two curves, vertical curves here. And so what's happening there, and I can fire up the grid editor to explain what's happening. All of the curves are listed here. And you can see that uh, this vertical curve at, uh, at these changes between this uh, location has a vertical curve length of 100 meters. It's also noted at the top here, the vertical curve length. And it's given an exclamation mark. And I'm given this uh, minimum VC length uh, information telling me that it has to be 157 uh, meters. So you'll see if I change that table, uh, and we increase our speed. So instead of using the safe stopping distance on the sealed road for 80 k's, if I change that speed to 70 k's and reduce the speed, then we get a different vertical curve length. So uh, another uh, option for reducing the speed to uh, make the design compliant, if that's the option. I'll probably, as a designer, you might not want to uh, try to change the speed limit. You'd have to engage the state um, so it goes to state government and uh, it's quite a challenge. Also low compliance would mean that the actual design speed, um, I know certainly here in WA main roads likes to, I guess, add 10 Ks an hour, which is more in line with driver behavior compared to the regulation and that's the design speed. So just keep in mind that merely reducing the speed limit, putting advisory signs doesn't necessarily mean you get a high compliance and you might still end up with a dangerous design. Okay, so yeah, you can see here it's all, all they're, they're all listed here. Now, if I wanted to um, bring, if I had a long road uh, and had lots of vertical curves, I can just click the VC tick button and this will attempt to apply a vertical curve length, um, which is compliant with the minimum VC length listed here. So I click on the tick and it will automatically assign this as the minimum to any of the non-compliant uh, vertical curves. Obviously that's limited by what's adjacent. If there was another vertical curve adjacent, then it won't be able to achieve uh, that vertical curve length and it will maximize the vertical curve length as to what's available. 
and just it will stay red with the with the X. So uh, we'll just change that back to 100 because I want some non-compliance uh, for our reporting later on. Okay, so we've got our design. We can uh, edit it in the vertical grading. Uh, there are other tools up in here. I've mentioned some of these in previous webcasts regarding the, uh, down the bottom here, I'm seeing the slopes and we can set our minimum slopes over here in the settings. Uh, I set that here, minimum grade, a maximum grade, maximum minimum, one and 10%. And so if I come in here and I edit one of these IPs and I violate that uh, minimum grade, you can see here, this is uh, noted down here as I, Hover near that, uh, that that tangent. The slope is listed at the bottom, and if it doesn't comply with those settings, then it will give it the uh, coloured warning. So I'm just going to uh, delete that IP. That's my clients. Okay. So moving out of the vertical grading editor, the minimum radius of bends um, that was listed in our uh, alignment tool but it can also be shown in our super elevation so we'll fire up the super elevation form it's down here in the uh, roads drop down so i've already set this one up uh, just to save us some time but you can see here i'm applying the urban super elevation table uh, you can edit this form but it's quite complicated it is listed in the help on on what the different um, parts of the document mean, but you have to be a full bottle on both the uh, process and the standard that you're trying to apply. So edit it if you choose, but uh, it has been set up to comply with the Osro standards for you. Here we can adjust our design speed. So you can see here, I, I can change this uh, on the fly, uh, run out my design and then come in and change it if I need to. Uh, here's our maximum super again, uh, because I'm using the Osro's urban table, I can only assign up to 5%. If I change this to rural, then I have the full gambit available. Now, it's also worth noting that I can't just choose the rural one and design an urban design and just choose 5%. The grades are different. Um, the length of the uh, curve in and curve out requirements are different. So you're going to have to choose the appropriate table. Um, you do get a slightly different behaviour uh, in New Zealand. They're allowed to use a lot more aggressive um, superlevation and it, that's a symptom of the uh, landscape there because it's so mountainous. Uh, so it's different rules in New Zealand, but for the majority, majority of design in Australia, if you're in an urban environment, maximum 5%. Okay, 30% in, 30% out. It's pretty standard. This is all as per uh, the standard. So you would click your compute superlevation options. It warns me that I'm about to overwrite the changes and it triggers the uh, bringing up of this tab. Uh, in the background, if you didn't already have super elevation, it would update your design. You can see here, I've got some super applied to this curve already. And here we can see, uh, for example, curve one that we're looking at. Uh, we've got this uh, normal end adjusted and gives me some data over here on the left. Now, if I go back to my design inputs and I wanna increase my speed, say to 100 k's an hour, and then I compute the super elevation. You can see here that I'm no longer achieving that minimum radius because I've increased the speed, the minimum radius is increased and my design is no longer compliant. So you'll get a warning over here in the comments. So I'll just go back and uh, put that back to 80. Okay, now because we chose the maximum of 5%, even if it wasn't compliant, it will still only achieve or only uh, increase the super elevation to 5% crossfall, uh, but it will just give us the warning. So you can design a substandard design. Um, if you're in charge as the designer, it just gives you the visual warnings. Okay, so happy with that. So that's our super elevation um, in relation to minimum radii and speed. Uh, the next thing I want to do is fire up the model viewer. This is quite a powerful uh, tool because it's so visual. Uh, you get a lot of uh, uh, visual prompts in your design as well as uh, quite an quite a impressive graphic, uh, graphical visual representation of, of your project. 
So in here, we're going to set up our um, speed table. We go over to the analysis tab. And in the site distance check, we can manage tables. Now, I've already made a few in here. Um, just to save time, I'm not going to go through and make one, but I'll click on the form and we'll walk through what's involved so you can make them yourself. Uh, when we start off, this, this form is blank. Uh, so none of these come equipped with the design. You have to make them individually for each road. Uh, you would click on add table, uh, give your uh, site table a name. Uh, I recommend naming it uh, with, a, with the string name itself as well as the uh, forwards or backwards direction because you're invariably make, making two, one for each direction, forwards and reverse. Uh, the reason for this is the string has a direction and you'll be designing uh, driving in that direction and the direction of the string influences which side of the road your eye position and your target will be. So for example, if we're going forwards along main road, I can just tell you that this uh, road heads in this direction from right to left. And so our eye position that we set up, we want to be midway between the center line and the LEV and we reference the surface to sit on the total model. Our target, will be on the midway between the center line and the REV, which will be on the opposite side of the road and sitting on our natural, on our total model. For the reverse direction, have to make sure that we tick the reverse button so the software knows to look in the opposite direction. So our eye position will be on midway between the right edge and the center line. So we're looking from the other side to the left midway between the center line and the left edge of Benjamin. Okay, so that's how we set it up. We choose our speed. So in here, you would choose uh, the uh, safe stopping distance for a, I'd like to use the, vehicle, the car for this uh, example, and I'm using 80 Ks. You can change the speed and the different vehicle uh, in that uh, site criteria table. And then you'll just add the range. Now that will populate uh, at this 10 meter interval, and it will populate this list for you. You can remove uh, individual and you can also add individual elements if you want extra ch checking at a particular area. So if you have a very long road, this might be quite a large list and you might not necessarily want 10 meter intervals. Um, so you might just go for every 100 meters, every 50 meters, and then locally increase, uh, increase the checks. Okay, so we've done that for um, a few of the roads. We've got three roads in this design. So I've got the main road, this is existing road, and this is uh, a road called road one. So we've made our speed check table. I've made a table for each one. I've used uh, 80 Ks for this, for the main road, and then 50 Ks for these two side roads, or minor roads. All right, so once we've made our speed check table, we can apply it to our line marking. So I've made our speed table here. Uh, I'll just show you what it looks like. Once you've made them, you choose the, uh, the site table that you've made and you can show it in the model viewer. So you can appreciate what's showing and what's not showing. You can see here the obstructed line here, these red lines that are obstructed and I can go down and have a look. Um, there's more viewing tools available, which we'll have a look at in a minute. Uh, but here you can see that it's obstructed in this uh, crest here. Those of you who, who would recall the design, we have a crest in the middle of our road. So I'll just bring up the one here again. So from in here, you can see that it's applied the uh, barrier line marking as it approaches and similar to the reverse, there's obstructed lines and so it applies a solid line in that environment as well. You can clean these up with the uh, line marking tools in the overrides. So how does it work? We set up our line marking and in here we assign the table. So here we've got the uh, site tables being applied and the line, lane style is uh, the center line lane style. A uh, very quick overview of this. Um, the lane styles are listed here and you give it a name and it gives you um, basically the options. It's automated here. So if in the different conditions, it will apply different line marking. So if you've got a obstructed in both directions or unobstructed, it's dashed. If it's obstructed in both directions, you'll get the uh, double barrier line. And depending on which direction, one side obstructed and dashed and the other side um, the reverse. 
So to signs that uh, line marking style. And depending on the visibility. So we've got our line marking styles. Uh, and if you make a change, you can always just refresh the line marking in here. There are other rules which are applied depending on the length, uh, depending on the speed that you're assigning. So ADKs will have different uh, uh, length, minimum line lengths, etc., being uh, applied. Uh, this may vary and you can edit this, of course, um, but this is all set up as per the OSROADS guides for you. So hopefully there's no need to work outside of those constraints. Uh, that's how the site tables are assigned to the line marking. Uh, you can also view the site distance. If I go to the analysis tab, uh, look in my site distance options. Over here on the site distance tab, uh, we're going to look at the uh, site criteria just briefly. In here, we use our ADKs, which we're applying to this main road. So uh, these are pretty standard from the Osteros guides as well. The eye height and the offset, etc. the different colours you can set in here. Now, specifically with the eye height and the target height, uh, this is a preset uh, offset. So when you're assigning your eye offset and elevation, it, you have to allow that already. So there will already be a standard eye height and there will already be a target height being assigned. Uh, so you don't need to add that to your uh, line marking setup. Okay, so we'll just move along here. I, I'll come back to the intersection check. We've got a, a lot to look at in there. So in the planar check, we're still working on the main road. So for our main roads forwards, uh, we can perform the planar check. Now you can adjust the size of our target uh, up here and the color. So I perform the check and you can see here, it's populating the list uh, with the uh, visibility percentage and animating my uh, drive through for that direction, for that string, for the target size that I've assigned. With that finished, now we scroll down, you can see we've got a nice uh, green to tell me that I've got over 90% visibility. As I come over that crest, we've got reduced visibility. And then back to the downhill side, where we've got a nice clean display. Uh, at the bottom here, there's a different color. Now I'll explain what's going on here when we do the report. So I'll close that. Now in the report, we get the same thing. The initial ones are all grayed out. Now for our main road forwards, if I click on this uh, change at change zero, we're stepping through the changes. Uh, I'll just bring that report into the full screen. It brings up all of the information, tells me my road name, um, the obstruction condition, uh, the type of site check, um, the uh, standard that it's applying. Uh, so you can see here that we've got our eye offsets and uh, there's quite a lot of information there. Basically just um, documenting the settings that we've assigned. Now, this is also handy because it's interactive. I'll just pull up to the side so we can see the visibility of the road. And as I click on these or arrow down, it steps through those uh, different uh, changes. And just before we go on with that, I just want to show my visibility lines for effect. So we can see that being displayed. Go back to my report and I can step through the different uh, different samplings. Now, as I get to the bottom here, there'll be some here which are obstructed. So two, change 240 is not obstructed, 250 is obstructed. And you can see here, that's where those lines start to turn red. Now in this form, uh, it will change the color of this uh, background in the report uh, for the obstructed. So it gives you a visual prompt as to which uh, in the report as to which uh, changes are obstructed. But as I scroll down, you see these end ones here are also a different color, um, but different to the obstructed lines. Now the reason for that is because there's just not enough room at the end of the sampling for it to do a valid check. So if it says, uh, at this change here, I can see that far and, and my sight line is unobstructed. It gives it a green and it comes up with the unobstructed line type. Uh, but then when I take a step forward to the next increment and now I'm looking in here, there's not enough room between here and the end of the alignment for it to give a valid check. It might be obstructed, it might be clear. And so that's why at the end of uh, the forwards direction and at the beginning 
of the reverse direction, keeping in mind that the change will be looking in the opposite direction, there's not enough room at the end for it to give a valid check. And so you'll get a, uh, a different color there. So important to note that if you want to do a check right up, for example, here through this intersection, I would have to extend that alignment and that design through so that I can get enough uh, room for it to give a valid check. Okay, so moving um, back, so I've done our report. What I want to do next is the intersection check. Now this is quite an interesting, uh, interesting tool and an interesting setup that I've got for you here. So I'm just gonna change what's being displayed to the uh, intersection. Uh, this is a speed table that I've set up and it's just showing me the visible and obstructed lines. So in this form, we'll go to the intersection check tool. Here, you just give it a name, similar to the uh, linear check. Uh, give it a name, choose your alignment, um, the change of the intersection, uh, and the frequency of the check. So two meters is pretty, pretty standard. Uh, through this form, it's just important to note that it is directional as well. So if this existing road uh, starts at the south side and moves from south to north, and this road one, starts here and moves um, from right to left. Uh, with the position, when you're setting up the side road position, um, I've obviously set this one here. You click that and you place uh, your uh, position in the plan and you can choose your location. Now, if I had that set over here, it would be looking at it from the opposite direction. I'm just gonna escape out of that. No, I'll have to place it. For this example, I'll click in here. I'm just gonna try and Get rid of that report. We'll come back to that. So if I do this and I've just placed that location over here, we click apply and we close the form, you'll see the check change. Refresh. We'll close this section. Check my site distance for the intersection. And because there's no total model out there, it's giving me a level down far too low. So I would have to change that surface to natural surface. So rookie mistake there. So you click on the uh, location out here because I'm off the total model, then my surface doesn't exist and it will go down to a, an uncalculable level. And so I need to change the surface here. We click apply, place that, and I get a site distance check in here. See so my natural surface is obstructing here. And so I get a different uh, result. Now, um, the reason why I wanted to show you this on, uh, out of bounds is because the site distance check, it's directional. So this, um, I'll just change my zoom so you can see it on the side. When setting up position B and C, uh, it expects you to be coming at it from the right. So if I move my eye position, or the vehicle position, to be and I press F3 to turn off my snaps, otherwise it might snap to the surface and give me a funny location. I'm just gonna choose a position back here. And the surface I'll change to the total model. Click apply, close that, resumed my check. Uh, you'll see here that this one's been shorter because it's checking the LEB or the distance halfway between the center line and the LEB. And this one's got longer checks because it's checking between the center line and the REB. And so in that tool, you're setting up position B and C, you may need to reverse these if you're coming at it from the opposite side. So when you're setting up position, just keep in mind that this illustration assumes you're coming from the right. Uh, so you just need to keep in mind um, when you're setting these up, have a look at the, uh, the lines that it's shooting. You make sure that they're correct. You may need to just check, uh, swap those around. So I've got those checks. Um, now, we can use the same reporting tool for our intersection check and same similar layout and the similar functionality. So I can click on these or arrow through and you can see it, and I'll just try and clear the view for you. If we step down, you can see it gives us a target and I'll just hold that down and steps through a bit closer now for the right hand side or for their left and I can look through all the checks. So it gives me a little target, shows me what I'm looking at and I can appreciate my design and how safe it appears to be. 
Now, the reason why I've shown you that and it's all clear is because um, there's often site constraints uh, which can add a uh, complex or more complexity to our design. So we've done our road check and you can see we're all green, so issue for construction, move on to the next job. The problem is that in, in the real world, there's often uh, issues uh, and other site constraints. So I'll just jump over to the objects. Now, I've already yeah. made something here. Yeah, mate. Uh, so um, I think you're going to be jumping on. The, we've had a question which I think relates to this absolutely perfectly. It says, assuming the site distance checked will ignore vegetation. Well, I guess with what you're just about to do now is to effectively simulate that vegetation or some kind of obstruction in some way, aren't you? I am, I am. That's actually a perfect segue. So whoever that, that person was has obviously read my notes. And <laughs> um, so thank you Great for that stuff. question. Uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so uh, some objects that I've created. Uh, so I'll turn on the objects that I've created and you'll just see that there's two. Um, there's just the car, which uh, we're in America because we're going backwards. That's uh, a little bit frustrating. So we've got that, uh, we've got our car and we've got a tree. So these objects themselves will not obstruct the sight line check. So even if I uh, refresh the model, the objects themselves won't refresh the check. So what I can do um, in my modeling I look down at that view and we can actually just use our site distance and go to our uh, report again for our intersection. Oops. Okay, so we bring that back and we step through and we can see I'm zooming through. Oh, look, there's a tree in the way, but that's, you know, not necessarily too big a deal. If I come around here and my car, which has come in reversed, uh, will be obstructing that sight line. So we can close this view, go back to our sight line check. So how do we manage this? It doesn't account for vegetation. What we can do is we can introduce a an extrusion which represents that and it will obstruct. So here I've made some uh, extrusions. I'm gonna show you guys quickly how I put that together. So down in here, back in my plan view, uh, we've got the, uh, the design and what I've done is in the layers, so here I've made a, a new layer called wall and just drawn a wall shape, which follows my boundary, not, not too dissimilar to what happens in an urban environment. I've drawn an outline for my car, uh, which is uh, may not necessarily be a car in a slip lane in this example, could also be a parked car, etc. And I've also drawn just a little um, polygon here. Uh, it doesn't accept circles or curves, so what you can do is just draw a, a polygon uh, and just give it lots of sides, uh, like a 50 cent piece, uh, and then you've got um, a representation of the tree trunk. Uh, this could be, if this was a wall of vegetation, as you see in the background here in this aerial photo, then you can um, use an extrusion that just takes the shape of the outline of that. Uh, and so when we go back to our model viewer, we can bring those extrusions in. So I'll turn those off, I'll just activate those. You can see here how it's included my extrusion for my wall and I've made a very tall, skinny extrusion representing the trunk of my tree and a nice cube which represents my vehicle which uh, has frustratingly decided to come in backwards. When this is orientated correctly, this uh, outline uh, takes the shape of that vehicle. You could, for a line of parked cars, you could have a uh, representation like this uh, that makes that extrusion represent uh, a bus stop or parked vehicles, um, walls, buildings, uh, whatever the obstruction might be. So to make an extrusion, we click on the extrusions button. Here are the three that I've made. So for tree, I just choose the name. I give it a name, so something descriptive. Uh, the layer, my layer is equally descriptive. Um, and the material and the top and side materials, not so relevant. Um, we're not really going to be looking at this for appeal more functionality. Uh, so for the base elevation, we set up the location. Now this form is familiar from the other uh, interactions with uh, setting objects uh, in the model viewer and other elements in civil site design. So we're not interested in the location. I've already chosen that um, with my positioning. So what I do here is uh, set the vertical elevation. Now we're only setting 
the base elevation. So we can just reference surface and I'm referencing the natural surface. Note that it's off the edge of the total model. So if I chose total model here, uh, it'll default to um, a non-value. Uh, so you've got a natural surface, I can apply that. For the wall, uh, we set the base elevation the same way. For the top elevation, uh, when we set up position, uh, we can set this to uh, reference the surface as well, and we just give it a height. So I'm set referencing the same surface, but I just give it an added level of 1.8 meters. And so that sets the top elevation. With the building, you may choose to flatten the top, whereas with the wall, I want it to follow the contours. So I leave that unchecked so that the 1.8 meter is maintained. If I tick, tick that, it'll find the highest point and maintain that level and you'll end up with a big wedge shaped wall. Uh, so we want, to main, we want to follow the contour of the ground, so I'm leaving that unticked. Uh, for the car, it's just a box which I've elevated um, up and to encompass that uh, model that I brought in of a car. I've used the material of water so that it's transparent and we can see the car in, inside. Uh, and so we can close that. That's how we would create the extrusion. Now, if I go back to my analysis, and I show my intersection, you can see now that it's been obstructed by the elements that have been extruded. So we can go back to my report, looking at our views. Now as my uh, target moves down, now I'm trying to look through a tree. Might still be okay, so long as it's a palm tree and not a, a big bushy tree. Uh, you can obviously change the shape and size of your, of your extrusion. I move through, and as I come through here, you can see now I'm obstructed. Uh, the colouring in my report has changed, and I'm trying to look through the, the vehicle. Uh, that might not be acceptable uh, for your sight line, and obviously my wall, depending on how encroaching that is into my road reserve, completely obstructed. Uh, because suddenly this design might need to be reviewed. Uh, and so that's subtracted for the rest of those sampling. So you can see here now um, that, that how that influences your design. It's very quick and easy to change these two, by the way. Um, you can just grab, don't plant the tree here. You know, plant the tree back here so it doesn't obstruct the sight line. Uh, then I go back into my model viewer and I hit refresh. And it moves my obstruction back and my sight line is now clear. Same with the wall, I can move the wall just as quickly and easily, redo the check, how close, how high can the wall be. Uh, for my extrusion, this is currently 1.8 metres high and my sight line is partially obstructed. Uh, so what I can do is I can come into my objects in my extrusions for the wall. Uh, for the top elevation, I set the position to 1.5. Click apply on that and close, it will adjust the height of my wall and you can see now that I'm able to see over the wall with the uh, standard eye height of the vehicle. So now the design is compliant with the lower wall and that's why you will see a lot of houses with uh, lower walls at the front and also roundabout infrastructure etc will be lower so you can get that sight line achieved. Terry. Okay, you know yeah, just a quick one. I wanted to mention this because I've, I've done training with uh, with the particular council and we had uh, a couple of um, power poles and uh, just using the extrusion, just drawing a polyline, I mean, effectively what you've done for the, um, for the tree position, I guess, we did something very, very similar and having that in the design as a cons or having it in model viewer just simply as a constraint it wasn't even related to site distance um, was extremely useful because they were moving a footpath and by having it there positioned an existing feature um, it's a it's a great way of adding effectively constraints to your design so extrusions have got a, a few different things you can do with them this is one of the most powerful parts as, as terry's showing you but you can just simply add them just as features um, that, that could possibly impact your design so i just wanted to mention that thanks terry no worries, mate. Yeah, definitely. Um, because you're in the you're in the cloud uh, in the CAD platform, because you're in the CAD platform, you can um, just copy this around. Um, I'm going to grip on that. Move, copy. Uh, so here's my trees. Um, oh look, I want a clump of trees or power poles or whatever the case may be. Um, I can edit my wall on the fly. So suddenly, um, 
the design, the planners have shafted me and, and given me a really crappy truncation or whatever the case may be. Um, now it's made it really ugly, but you can you get the idea where you can make these adjustments in CAD uh, to a polyline, which is quick and easy, and then you just simply come back to your model viewer. No extra work. I just have to refresh it. And now I've got a new shape and uh, very low, so it's no longer obstructed. Um, and like I said before, you can just adjust that height uh, for the object. It's very, uh, very quick and easy. Once, once you know where the controls are, uh, just jump into the wall, set up the other top elevation, 1.8. So if this was a full size uh, fence, apply on that. Lift my wall up, redoes the check, now obstructed. So um, you can very quickly and easily make these adjustments uh, from a road designer point of view. Um, if you had parked cars along here and this was a representation of those, uh, you can just move those parked vehicles back. Um, very common, for example, bus stops around schools and sight lines, they're obviously very critical if you've got kids, so you don't want them running out from behind a bus. Um, and if you've ever tried to drop your kids off, um, it can be very challenging uh, with uh, the chaos at a school car park. So you can help uh, or try and improve that safety by using these tools where you can have a big bus uh, shape uh, and extrude that into your design, check the sight lines, uh, and you can get an appreciation for the safety or danger of, of the situation based on that. Terry. So yeah, so, yeah, mate. Sorry, there was just one other one other point I was going to make about these because they've they've kind of. Um... The, the different areas you can use the, the extrusions. Um, buildings is another one. Um, we obviously won't be displaying it today, but if you want to create uh, a building of some sort or a shape of a building to, to give some context to your design, particularly with Model Viewer, um, then uh, certainly adding in uh, polylines that represent buildings, giving them elevations, etc. cetera, um, certainly worth uh, using them for that as well. So just thought I'd mention that. Thanks, Terry. No worries. Um, it's very quick and easy to smash out a building. Um, you really just need the layer. So um, if I, I'm not reluctant to uh, just smash one in there, JT, if I've got time. I think we've got like five minutes. And I'll just do BLD for building. Make that the current layer. Just to demonstrate to users how quick and easy this can be. Questions without notice. And we just make an outline of our building. This can be an existing building and I'm tracing it from the aerial or a plan. Uh, turn my snaps back on. Uh, the architects are cringing. So I just need a shape. It doesn't have to be closed, um, but if you want to put a roof on it, then, then obviously it does. So then I can just put, uh, here's my building, just a polyline shape. Uh, it doesn't have to be regular, but it can't accept arcs. Just keep that in mind. So we've got our shape for our um, custom building. Jump back into our model viewer. And, and then in our extrusions, we can very quickly just create one at a group. And we're just going to call it building. In the layer called, uh, let's put that building, BLD. Side material. Now these come with the with the software. You can um, add these, uh, so the material um, that it's applying. Uh, so we've got this building material, which is just a photo of the side of the building. You can actually go on site, take a photo, add it to your model, uh, and then you can use that image, which is quite impressive. It does tile it around, but uh, it does give a representation of what's going on. For the top material, uh, I'm going to change that one to uh, roof. Here I've used the wall. Uh, here I've used just the earth and the, and the grass. So there's all different options available. Uh, you can just add your own. Now, for the uh, base elevation, uh, we'll specify the surface, and this is fine. For the top elevation, again, I'll specify a surface. We'll go with NS, and I'll give my building a height of, uh, I don't know, three metres. Click apply on that. Now, I want to flatten the top based on the maximum height because my building isn't going to follow the contours. Building's going to have a flat roof. So we can click on that. And I've missed a step somewhere. My building didn't turn up. I might just hit the refresh. Oh, surprising. Building, name's building layer. Side material roof, base elevation, reference on the surface. 
So those just are the check, steps. Just there. check underneath the model, Terry, just very quickly. Just check underneath. Um, yeah, interesting. It could just be that the layer is not being picked up, but um, yeah, normally that would. Yeah, well, that's be. basically the workflow that I followed yeah. to create these other ones. You see how they've displayed. So that's what I was expecting is something like this to come in where you've just got the side material. Uh, and you can you can see this is it's quite detailed actually it's quite nice um, you've got uh, materials that come in uh, this is just a wall photo uh, if you go to the home tab you can assign the materials in here and so you can see here we've just got um, photos of materials these are the same uh, methodology that uh, the uh, surface is rendered with so you'll see the grass which is listed you can see here in our verge or the verge is, as it's named uh, the different materials here's the water uh, that I put a box around the car with, and here's the transparency set to 50%, so you can see through the water and see what's underneath. Uh, a few different uh, ones that come with the packet. Here's our building image and the roof, which is just some um, just some metal, so it would just be a box with that uh, with that material sign. But you can add materials in here, take a photo, change the scale, adjust transparency. They're all listed here, uh, so you can just add your own photos down here. So yeah, uh, the last thing on the road safety elements that I wanted to show you. So we're out of the model viewer now. Let me close that. And we'll come up and the last thing is the report. So up here on the exclamation button, click on the report button, ask for which road. I'm gonna come back to our main road out here. So you can name your project main road um, at the location of uh, main road town. Uh, and I'm sure they don't name towns after the roads, but uh, you give a description, populate your report, uh, and it shows you the different uh, elements which have been considered. Now, if we look through the different um, uh, tabs, you can see horizontal geometry, we're all good. Uh, this is the um, criteria that's being assigned and how, and the settings that were assigned. For the vertical geometry, you may recall right at the beginning, I deliberately left a substandard vertical curve in, and so that appears here with our VC length, it's currently 100. Uh, and so here's the, uh, the calculation that contributes to that failing this particular standard and the planar site check. Uh, same as before, here we can set that to being the forwards report and we can step through and you can see our planar check here in a documented form which can be output as a report. So that's pretty much all of the road safety tools that I intended to show you guys today. Um, pretty sure we're pretty close to bingo on time. So um, unless there's any other questions with that notice, JT, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, um, at present, yeah, no, we, we, we've had a couple of questions that were sort of related to what, obviously what you've been showing and we've answered those um, certainly in respect of the extrusion, that was a great job, um, sort of just talking through the, uh, the, you know, the question about vegetation. Just so users are fully aware, um, if you have jumped into this webcast late, we are running this on CSD Plus, which is pretty much fundamentally the AutoCAD version of Civil Site Design. So the alignments tab or alignment information uh, uh, that, that Terry was showing at the very start is only applicable to uh, users that are using um, the AutoCAD or BricsCAD version of Civil Site Design. Civil 3D users, you will create your own Civil 3D alignments. Therefore, any of the uh, design constraints or design checks that you apply to those alignments are all going to be Civil um, Civil 3D. Beyond that, though, everything else Terry's been showing you um, is um, is obviously still relevant because obviously we're putting strings on top, uh, we're applying vertical design. That's when all of those tools will be just as relevant um, to you. Now, um, if you have got any other questions, um, feel free to drop them in. Uh, as yet, it's still very quiet. Um, uh, haven't had anything else come through. So what we might do, unless we get anything, uh, anything in the next couple of seconds, might just pop onto the final slide. Unless you've got anything else you want to add, Terry. Uh, no, mate, I'll, uh, I'll stop the share and hand back to you. Um, so for those of you that uh, weren't aware from the start, we are uh, we put all of these webcast recordings onto the YouTube channel. There is a dedicated playlist. There's also uh, an access to the YouTube channel on the welcome screen, scratch screen. Uh, welcome screen, not welcome spleen, as I just said there inadvertently. We have just had a question come in just as we were talking, uh, which was about, um, are the speed tables available in the Civil 3D alignment edit screens? Uh, no, no, they won't be. Certainly they're, they're com two completely separate products um, in respect of anything related to the alignment. So uh, Leon, just, unfortunately. Uh, just on that, um, Civil 3D does have its own speed tools, uh, yes. but a lot of the time they apply an ASHTO, which is American standard. Um, so just keep that in mind, they do have 
tools there, they're slightly different. Um, I think if you get the ANZ uh, country kit, then they do have an Osroads uh, option, but just keep in mind that it is, uh, they do have their own alignment uh, tools, which are different to ours. Uh, and, and, and as if that wasn't a, a better segue, Terry actually did a civil 3D alignments and profiles webcast in March, which will be in our webcast playlist. So you did cover some of the design checking uh, uh, and whatnot in that particular webcast. So if you do get a chance, go and have a look and uh, see if that certainly helps with, uh, with that. Going forward uh, into June 2020, uh, we've got a uh, webcast next week, which will be pre pre presented even by uh, our colleague Shane uh, on what's new in the Autodesk 2021 release, um, everything related around the civil infrastructure. Following that, we've got a couple of extra ones uh, following that in, uh, in June. And if you want to find out or go and register for these particular webcasts right now, rather than wait for the newsletter to come out, um, pretty much the day before, which is when we get most of our registrations, uh, feel free to pop along to the website and have a look. You can also provide us with feedback and suggestions, which is uh, extremely helpful to us in uh, putting together future webcasts. Terry, thanks so much for your presentation today. Really concise, very, very thorough, lots to get through, which was uh, very, very interesting. If anybody uh, has any questions or suggestions, as I said, please visit, visit the website for this particular page. Other than that, we hope you all have a, a great rest of the week. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Terry. No worries, JT. Thanks for hosting and uh, thanks for everyone for watching. Thanks, guys.